Okay, we're a little more than half over. We're going to listen to Jake for a minute. What I asked Jake to do, this originally started out with the idea of having a location where some Jake could come down in an urban area and, and tell us what, what they used to do. The airborne soldiers were very aggressive. They used uh, extra tactics and things. But uh, what an opportunity to hear from an actual veteran who uh, jumped in at Normandy, went through Market Garden. And Jake's going to tell us a little bit about what he would have done today, how he would have attacked, attacked the town. And we've got his book available for those of you who want to get one between now and then. And uh, if you want to leave your name with them on a piece of... The best thing they do is like you write out your name on a piece of paper and let them have it. He can see it and, and, and sign a book for you today uh, before you leave while we go back into the town. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to... Do you have anything else, Roger? I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jake. And if we don't catch it before the end of the day, thank you very much. And uh, we'll probably do this again. And if anybody has an idea of how we can improve this, let us know. Okay, thank you. I was all happy to be here with you today and just see that y'all are keeping the atmosphere alive that you are with your reenactments and your participation. I also am, would like to thank some of you who are going into public schools and uh, civilian groups and talking to them and giving them a little bit of orientation about the military services and forces of the United States and what we're accomplishing. I speak quite a bit to different groups, this and that, and uh, people pretty well take their freedoms and liberties and privileges here for granted. They don't understand or know that 450,000 young men and women paid for it with their lives in World War II, and that there's 80,000 young American men and women that are MIAs, or missing in action. They have no idea what happened to them. So I want to thank all of you, each one of every one of you, for going ahead and keeping this in view of the public and giving them some idea of what they are enjoying and how it is being paid for at this present time. Uh, uh, I noticed on your approach here this morning on this village, uh, there was two or three things that I would have done, that we would have done in World War II. Of course, we would have attacked it from the north from the high ground and we would have particularly fought from the, the left side here, the west side, at an angle where you had uh, elevation on them. Uh, we did an awful lot of street fighting. We were more or less belt buffaling, eyeball to eyeball in our fighting, as most of the real troops are. When we would attack the village, when we would attack the village, such as this, where there were, were structures, we first tried to hit it with some type of a border fire or any kind of bazookas and anything that we had that you could get them to move in around. Then I would have had one of my men placed on this elevation here to the left and one on the right that was good sniper men. Because uh, when you get into a town fighting, the crowd cannot stand cold steel. They don't like bayonets or knives. Uh, when Carrington, France, the first major city that was taken, and Normandy on D-Day, or 12 days after D-Day. It was a very important town. It was a major network of highways and railroads and dual canal crossings and this and that. The 502nd tried to take it and were defeated. The 501st tried to take it and they were defeated. And then the 506 decided they would go in on it at daybreak with 650 of us in a frontal bayonet attack. They don't like those bayonets at all. When I was over there this year, and, and uh, during the 60th anniversary, I went in, I, I took a film crew in with me that was making a documentary, and I took them into a cathedral there in Carrington, France. For two or three days after we took Carrington, we kept having a paratrooper sniped in this street or that street. But every street that one was sniped in, you could look up and see the temple of this big cathedral. So it became obvious that someone in the steeple, in the steeple was killing the paratrooper. They sent me and two other boys in to clean it out, and when we got in there, it was two French men and one French woman that was doing the sniping. So we killed them and came on out and went about our business. When I was over there this past month, uh, they had me in the tabernacle or cathedral, whatever they call it, and 
they had set up cameras and this and that and was taking pictures, wanting to know how it all happened. And I was telling them, and a young Frenchman came in with a lady that was quite elderly and she was dressed in black and had on the headdress that they wear in their cathedral. And she was crying and tears were running down her head. We embraced and kissed cheeks and she said mercy beaucoup, mercy beaucoup and then kept talking. Well, I was trying to apologize for having entered their sanctuary of worship, you know, to pursue war. But that is what should be done in every war. You don't pay attention. To forget the Geneva Convention. No one else lives by it, so you shouldn't either. But respect their properties if you can. But if it becomes an issue, then go ahead and kill or attack or destroy any way you want to. So I was kind of trying to apologize to her for that. And this young Frenchman told me, he said, this was a lady that was a little 11-year-old girl when y'all attacked it. Carrington, France, with bayonet. And said she stood right in her front room and watched the bayonet and knife fighting in the streets. And said she just wants to thank you for having come in and liberated them from the Nazi occupation and for killing the three German, I mean the three French old traitors that were in the steeple. Uh, I would have had a sniper on each one of these elevations because when you go in, I didn't hear, I didn't hear rapid rifle fire, and then a grenade go off and things like that. Normally when we would go into a town and fight in a town, we would have two or three boys shooting at the doors and windows, and another boy walk in and open the door and throw a grenade in on them. Uh, when you start doing this, they would start moving around the edge of the night and they would give you a whole moment. But, you also would have had the sun at your advantage. You take care. You have to take every advantage you can when you're in there fighting. But uh, if, if you can get the sun behind them to their side at an angle, you have a silhouette always to shoot at. And they cannot see you out of that position. So y'all are doing a good job, but you need to uh, uh, attack more rapidly than what I was here. And I heard rifle fire. Or some purple gun over in this area back out of here, probably 50 yards. That was saying that what was doing was quite a long. They weren't moving around and traveling. You have to keep moving or they'll eat you up. And if you are aggressive, I'll guarantee you that they'll retreat. And once you get them in retreat and out in the open, well, you can kill them like dogs. That's the only thing 